a couple of things that you're going to need to get into on homework two that are maybe new from last time. You're finding that you're diving into to using programming tools uh, right away. So one of the things that you're going to need to do is uh, in, when you're constructing your program in Python, you're asked at the end to do something like, okay, now take this program that you've written and evaluate it for a bunch of different conditions or a bunch, a bunch of different cases. Um, so that might, in this example, it's diameter, right? You're, you're trying to look at how your answer changes um, if you're varying the diameter of the, uh, of the resin, right? That kind of implies that you have some function that you're using. Um, so what you want to do is you write your whole program to answers part, what, A through C or D or whatever it is. Uh, that gives you this, the answer for the geometry that's given, and then you're asked to start varying something. All you need to do is take the entire contents of your program, tab it over, and say function, whatever, my, my homework assignment, and then make an argument that is the thing that's varying. So in, in this case, it would be the diameter. So now you have a function. Every time you call that function, the entire program evaluates for the diameter that you're passing in. You want to make sure that you comment out the hard-coded diameter, otherwise nothing's going to happen. Um, and, and then you can uh, have it return from the function the thing that you want to plot. Maybe that's uh, temperature, uh, maximum temperature or heat transfer rate or whatever it, it might be. Right, so you're, you're passing in the thing that's varying, and you're returning back from the function the thing that you want to, to capture. Um, so I would recommend uh, taking that approach, writing a function, rather than repeating the same code you know, 100 times or something like that. Um, it just makes it easier. Um, and then in terms of approach for this homework, uh, again, I'm asking you to do an analytical and numerical solution. So the, I think the wording's slightly awkward, but what I'm really asking you to do is you go through, you develop your analytical solution, then you go through and do a numerical solution with the intent of being able to accommodate temperature-dependent properties, right? But before you get to the temperature-dependent stuff, let's go back and make sure that the spatially-dependent one matches the analytical solution, right? That's, that's what I'm trying to get to there. So you'll go through the trouble of uh, making the comparison. They should exactly match, and then you can do something new. Okay, other, other questions? Yeah. Um, because in uh, very uh, short order, you're not going to be able to solve these problems in ease. So I kind of want to ramp up to being able to do stuff in Python rather than just throw the hardest stuff at you right away in Python. Yeah. So try to force yourself to, to learn the programming language because, honestly, it's one of the skills, if, if anything, out of this class you'll carry with you is being able to program with a, with a programming language. Um, uh, there was a typo, I'll call it a typo, <laughs> in the quiz uh, lecture four comment. So if you got, I think it was question wrong, uh, one wrong, uh, there, something said correct, right? It's obviously not correct. So the, the question one was asking about homogeneous versus non-homogeneous for a, an equation that was non-homogeneous. So the answer was false. And if you clicked false, or you clicked true, it said correct. So just to clarify that, that um, it was graded correctly, but the comment in there was wrong, so if you're confused by that. OK. Um, one more thing that I wanted to do before we start uh, getting into stuff is that I think it's, it's valuable to just step back, take a breath, think about, again, what we're trying to do here in the class in general, but specifically as we're going through analytical and numerical solutions. Right? We're, we've now, we've now like jumped into heat transfer. We're doing problems. But sometimes it's hard to see the forest, right? See the forest for the trees. So remember what we're trying to do. So we, we have these, all these equations that involve temperature and heat, which we call T and Q or Q dot. There's a relationship between those two that's, go, that's uh, given to you by the rate equation, right? The rate equation for conduction is Fourier's law for convection, Newton's law of cooling. Radiation has its own law, right? Those are our way of relating heat to temperature. We always need to be able to relate heat to temperature uh, because we, there is no such thing as a temperature or conservation of temperature, right? There's only th such a thing as conservation of energy. So when we're going through an analysis, we need to start by doing conservation of energy to get our Q dot and then relate Q to T. And that's, that's the theme for this entire class is figuring out how to get temperature, temperature profiles out of heat-based 
control volumes. Right? So just try to remember that as we go through this, uh, the processes with analytical and, and numerical and all that, everything we're trying to do is to get to some distribution of temperature using heat. Okay. So just keeping that in mind. Okay. Uh, other questions before we get started? Nope. All right. So today we're going to be talking about numerical solutions uh, using matrix decomposition and something called Gauss-Seidel iteration. So these are two separate methods. We'll talk about both of them. Um, and it, these sort of follow from the, the discussion that we had last time, which was using ease to solve a numerical solution. We're back visiting our uh, current lead, the same problem we had before. It's this long wire. We have a hot uh, amp, uh, room temperature condition, and we're trying to get electricity down to a cold uh, cryogenic condition. So the wire is generating heat because there's electricity uh, moving through it. And then you have potentially conduction actually into the experiment that you don't want. You, know, you don't want heat there. You're trying to get, get as much heat out as you can. All right, so let's, um, let's talk about this matrix decomposition idea. Uh, there's really these, these three ways or three large uh, classes of um, solution techniques when it comes to numerical methods. Uh, later, we'll get into specific um, sort of versions of these. But uh, first, you can plug in the problem in ease, which we already did. And that's just coming up with a system of equations where you have n temperatures that are unknown, and you have n equations, and you can solve that system. And it doesn't really matter if the temperatures are embedded in the equation or not, because ease can handle that. For a matrix decomposition, now we're moving away from ease. Like, let's imagine that um, we've gotten to a problem where n has to be 10,000. Right? You need that many nodes to, to model it accurately. Well, actually, ease can't do that, right? At least the academic version of ease can't do that. You can pay thousands of dollars and, and have the professional version do that. But still, it's, it's actually probably not the right tool for that. It's going to take a long time to solve. It might not solve at all. You might need to have really precise um, guess values to begin with, right? So it just might not be the right tool. So let's figure out how you actually can solve the, these types of problems using matrix decomposition in a programming tool like Python. You can also do the same thing in MATLAB, but uh, we'll, we'll go through this exercise in Python. All right, so here's our, our system of equations. This is what we uh, came up with last time. For the current lead, we have our equation for node 1, which involves um, a contact resistance and conduction to node 2. And then there's every term is going to have its internal energy generation. Uh, this is for node i. So node i would be nodes 2 through n minus 1. That's got conduction both from the lower and upper uh, bounds of the control volume, in addition to the generation. And then at node n, again, we have our contact resistance that's being modeled here. Right, so that's our system of equations. There's n equations and n unknowns. If you tried to plug this into Python, as it appears here, you'd get nowhere. Right? It would immediately say, I don't know what t2 and t1 are. So you need some way of, of coming up with like explicit relationships uh, based on, on these equations. All right, so when, when we talk about uh, matrix inversion, right, what is it that we're actually saying? Well, let's take a really simple, trivia, trivial example. So let's say we have a system of equations, and we express it uh, like this. Let's say I'll just make up some coefficients. So 2x1 plus 3x2 plus x3 is equal to 1. Right? That's one equation. Uh, I need. I have three unknowns, x1, x2, x3, so I would need two more equations. Let's just make something up. It would be maybe x1 plus 5x2 plus x3 is equal to 2. Uh, we could also have 7x1 plus x2 plus 2x3 is equal to 5. Right? These are just three equations that I have that I can now solve because I have three equations, three unknowns. So matrix decomposition says, let's express this set of equations, which is a linear set of equations. Right, Every single term is just the variable times some constant is equal to some constant. Right, That's a, a linear set of equations. Uh, we can use linear algebra to solve that problem. So I would write this in matrix form like this. Right? 2, 3, 1. That's our coefficients for the first equation. Second would be 1, 5, 1. Third would be 7, 1, 2. Right? So this is my coefficient matrix. 
This is commonly called A. Uh, and to note that it's a two-dimensional matrix, we would put maybe two lines underneath it. So that's A. We have our variable matrix. Uh, normally, that's like an X. Here we have uh, Xs. In the problem above, it would be Ts. But we would write that as our, our, our vector. So that would be x1, x2, x3. Right, so that would be B. That's a one-dimensional matrix. So we get one line. Sorry, that's not B. That's x. That's x with one line under it. And that has to equal B, which is 1, 2, 5. So B, one line under it. All right, so I can now use, uh, you can go back to your linear algebra. You can use linear algebra to solve this. What you're trying to do is identify the inverse of this matrix here. Right? You're trying to invert A. And then you uh, can say x is equal to uh, b times the inverse of matrix A. Right. Um, so let's, uh, we'll use this concept just to quickly refresh ourselves on what it is. The challenging part of all this is finding the inverse of A. Right? That's the hard part. Because what you're really doing is you're solving the set of equations. So the inverse gives you that solution. Um, one thing to note about this that's a little different is here I've got this square matrix. You're always going to have a square matrix when you're doing this type of problem. Um, if it's not square, that means you don't have, you either have too many unknowns or you have too many equations. Um, but this is a square matrix. This particular example has coefficients in every single position in that matrix, which means it's, it's a non-sparse matrix. In our problems, if you look at this a little bit more carefully, you'll see, OK, for, T, for this first equation, I have a temperature T1, T2. No other temperatures are going to appear on that first equation, that, that first row, right? So you would have coefficient here, a coefficient here, and then a bunch of zeros. For this equation, you would have at the i position, i minus 1 and i plus 1, something. Right? So as you go along this diagonal, you're going to have something right around the center of that diagonal. And then the last equation is going to only have stuff at the end. So you're going to have, a, a depending on the size of n, you're going to have a huge number of zeros, which makes it uh, called a sparse matrix. Right? When you have a sparse matrix, there's special <laughs> techniques that you can use to solve those or invert those matrices more efficiently. Right? And we'll make, you have to make sure to use those. Otherwise, um, for the size of n we're, we're using, it becomes intractable to do it without using sparse matrices.